I've really been looking forward to our reader tonight. Floyd Sklute is a nonfiction writer, poet, and novelist whose work has appeared in a range of distinguished publications and magazines. His 15 books include The Memoirs, In the Shadow of Memory, A World of Light, and one of his three books that are coming out this year, The Wink of the Zenith, The Shaping of a Writer's Life, which Floyd says is going to be out in the fall, right? Books of Poetry, The Evening Light, Approximately Paradise, The End of Dreams, and Selected Poems, 1970-2005, which I believe is the book that's in galleys and is coming out soon. It's not here and available yet, but he says it's going to be out in about three weeks. And the novel Summer Blue in 1994 and Patient 002 in 2007. He's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Oregon Book Award for both creative nonfiction and poetry. His alma mater, too, is Franklin and Marshall College, and I can call attention to that because he received in 2006 an honorary doctorate, Doctor of Humane Letters. Would you join me in giving a strong welcome to our reader tonight, Mr. Floyd Sklute. Floyd. I'm so pleased to have a day as you can see me over. Usually that doesn't happen with me. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me okay? Thank you all for coming, especially as I mentioned to someone else on a night when American Idol results show was on. <laughs> I'd like to begin by reading a love poem for my wife, Beverly, who is back there manning the bookstore. Um, this is called Silent Music. And for many years, Beverly and I lived in a little round house in the middle of 20 acres of woods out uh, near Amity. And she would uh, play her electronic keyboard with the headphones in. So we'd be sitting out there in the middle of the woods and she'd be playing and there would be no music. So this is silent music. My wife wears headphones as she plays Chopin etudes in the winter light. Singing random notes, she sways in and out of shadow while night settles. The keys she presses make a soft clack. The bench creaks when her weight shifts, golden cotton fabric ripples across her shoulders, and the sustain pedal clicks. This is the hidden melody I know so well, her body finding harmony in the give and take of motion, her lyric grace of gesture measured against a slow fall of darkness. Now stillness descends to signal the end of her silent music. Actually, this whole section that I'd like to read now, four or five poems, is a section of love poems They're just for different, different people, like my grandparents and my daughter. Uh, the, next, the next poem is called Currents. And I used to live uh, in the Johns Landing area and walk every morning along the waterfront or along the riverfront. And this was a scene I witnessed between two uh, great blue herons, which seemed to me a scene rich in metaphorical meaning. Currents. The great blue heron rides a cottonwood limb downriver. She spins through a circle of sunlight as her mate's wide loops dazzle the morning, and his horse squawk says he would join her if he could. He swoops close to see again there is no room. She turns her long neck slower than the limb turns in the strong current, keeping him in sight as though she imagines currents of air mimic dark river currents she will dare when the time comes. He moves 
like a dancer past his prime, a beat slow for her and just off the mark, but game while she waits against the measure for a moment they can enter together. My grandparents, Rose and Max, um, were good old Eastern European folk, and they loved to dance. And they danced in their own fashion and had earned the right because they were married for almost 70 years. This is called My Grandparents' Dance. My grandparents' stately polka was done in waltz time no matter the music's speed. They turned slow, whistling circles that spun through other dancers' wakes and freed something in them I had never seen before. This smiling man was the old country Max, so graceful as he moved across the floor with a hand spread low on Rose's back. And this gliding woman with fingertips grazing Max's shoulder flowed on the rise and fall of their dance as she slipped the weight of all her years, head back, eyes closed. Her gown sparkled as she twirled under his raised arm and he gazed down at her in wonder. Continuing the love section, the next poem I want to read is the one that's on the broadside that you received, Kansas, 1973. This poem concerns a drive that I, that I made across the state of Kansas in the summer of 1973 with my 10-month-old daughter beside me. Doesn't he like my work? <laughs> Um, with my 10-month-old daughter in the car seat beside me. Um, tomorrow, Beverly and I are flying to Memphis to spend a week with that now 35-year-old daughter. And where has the time gone, you know? Um, it's always intimidating for me to read this poem because a year ago when the book The End of Dreams came out, Garrison Keillor read this poem on the Writer's Almanac. And you know, he has that Garrison Keillor voice and presence. And so I'm going to use my little wimpy tenor and read it myself. <laughs> it's my poem, Garrison. <laughs> and he didn't read it right, if I read Isn't that right? Isn't that the poem where he skipped a word or he changed a word? Oh. <laughs> Kansas, 1973. My daughter, nestled in a plastic seat, is nodding beside me as though in full agreement with the logic of her dream. I am glad for her sake the road is straight, but the dark shimmer of a summer road where hope and disappointment repeat themselves all across Kansas like a dull chorus makes the westward journey seem itself a dream. She breathes in one great gulp taking deep the blazing air, and stops my heart until she sighs the breath away. The sun is stuck directly overhead. <clears throat> I thought it all would never end. The drive, the heat, my child beside me, the bright day itself, that fathering time in my life. We were going nowhere and never would, as in a dream or in the space between time and memory. I saw nothing but sky beyond the horizon of still treetops and nothing changing down the road ahead. <coughs> this is another poem that Garrison Keillor read a week later. And this one he did, he did just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's called Latin Lessons, and in the seventh grade, you know, I was 12, 13, um, I took Latin, and it was taught by this 
really beautiful young woman, and it was very hard for us to concentrate <laughs> um, at that age, particularly. Um, and of course, we all fell in love with her, and toward the end of the year, she developed leukemia and died. So, Latin lessons. The daughter of the local florist taught us Latin in the seventh grade. We sat like hothouse flowers, nodding in a mist of conjugations, declining nouns that made little sense and adjectives that missed the point. She was elegant, shapely, taut. She was dazzling and classic, a perfect example to us of such absolute adjectives as quite and too, or perfect. The room held light. Suffering from acute puberty, we could still learn case by case to translate with her from the ancient tongue by looking past her body to the chaste scribblings she left on the board. We were young, but knew that the ablative absolute was not the last word in being a part of something while feeling ourselves apart from everything that mattered most. We chased each other on the ball field after class, though it did no good. What we caught was not what we were after, no matter how fast we ran. She first got sick in early fall. A change in her voice, a flicker of pain across her face, and nothing was the same. She came back to us pale and more slender than ever, a phantom orchid in strong wind, correcting our pronoun and gender agreement, verb tense, going over all we had forgotten while she was gone. Long before she left for good in early spring, she made sure the dead language would remain alive inside us like a buried spring. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm really enjoying myself. <laughs> and, and you're a wonderful audience. This is terrific. The next poem is a little longer than these others, and it it's the last of the love poems for now. And it's a love poem to the home and the property that we had in Amity. It's called the Amity Hills. Um, and I think a lot of poets have touchstone poems, have poems that they love and that they return to for refreshment. They can't read it enough times. Um, I think of Robert Frost, After Apple Picking, or A Silken Tent. I don't know if you know that one, but it's one of Frost's love poems that begins, she is, as in a field, a silken tent. I read that over and over. Or the four quartets of T.S. Eliot, which are magic for me. Uh, William Carlos Williams' uh, poem, To Waken an Old Lady, or The Widow's Lament in Springtime. Um, these are touchstone, po touchstone poems for me. But above them all, the one for me is Dylan Thomas's Fern Hill. Now as I was young and easy under the apple boughs about the lilting house and happy as the grass was green. I've just loved that poem all my life. And so when it came time for me to write a love poem for my land, this place where Beverly and I had lived together for 15 years. I decided I would write a poem that used the exact form that Fern Hill used. The same rhyme scheme, the same pattern of syllables in each line, everything the same in terms of its structure. But of course, I'm me, I'm not Dylan Thomas. I mean, I'm 60, he never got this far, for one thing. Um, but also, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to imitate him or imitate his poem. I was trying to pay homage to it. And that poem is about, for him, the way his childhood land was paradise. And for me, my childhood land in Brooklyn, New York, was not paradise. <laughs> but my adult land, the place where I lived and loved with Beverly, was paradise. In fact, that's why I have a book of poems called Approximately Paradise, which is about that land. And this poem is from that book. It's called The Amity Hills, and essentially is about 
what's a Brooklyn boy doing there? And what, is it, what does it mean to him? Amity Hills. I came here uneasy with the strange ways of forest life. The crying sound of a white oak swaying in winter wind. Mellow huff of deer settling to sleep on a slope. The soft rain after sunset has spread like a stain, becoming sudden storm rushing through the valley as night falls. Or the steady return of wildness across a thin margin we have made to keep ourselves still within the season's wax and wane. And I was slow to fathom the loudmouthed tree frog's bright green exuberance in underbrush as the pond rose with March runoff. Never knew what fog looked like from above or how it seeped through leaves like the spirit of a breeze. What dawn light does to the dew trapped on a torn window screen. I had not slept outdoors or lost myself under an arch of fir and climbed the hillside's contours home. I never felt as free as the evening grosbeak bursting like flame from a snowdrift in late November, as the maple trapped in its cycle of reddening but soon enough to begin budding. Life was slow to change here, but change would go on endlessly and seldom seemed to change pace. Morning mist sometimes formed itself into a blazing rainbowed circle above our house and would do a kind of dance before it was through with us. I never knew how connected weather was to the tint of leaf or light was to where a coyote crossed a hill. Time was to the space a forest claimed for deadfall, till, near fifty, I finally left the city and went to be with my love in her round house in the woods, where soil was hard, water deep, and the late June air was cool. We live where nothing is tame, above a small town called Amity, at the stony end of an ancient lava flow, on massed rock left by ice age floods. Poison oak and blackberry vines thrive here. By year's end, a creek will rise from the hill's heart and pour for six months upon the valley floor, dwindling back underground when the summer solstice has passed. Time here has drawn me out beyond strangeness, or drawn me in. I have learned that surprise is not always shock and nothing to fear, that the dark-eyed juncos throng when wild fennel goes to seed, that Indian summer can color a landscape of dreams gold through a winter of freeze and thaw, that the pattern of wind and the way old growth trees have been thinned together help a harsh September rain carve itself deep into the ridge exactly where the evening sun always seems to soften the least flaw in all we see before the dark begins. So now we're going to shift from the love section to the family section. Um, and by family, I mean the family of origin, family I grew up in in Brooklyn, New York. My parents really didn't like each other. and contrived a way of living in an apartment in Brooklyn so that they would never see each other. He would get up at three in the morning to go to open his live poultry market. She would get up at about noon. <coughs> he would come home at about seven, have dinner and be in bed by eight. They had one hour when their paths crossed. Um, the poem I want to read next is called Twilight Time. You know that song? I love reading to audiences of my age. <laughs> you remember, right? Heavenly shades of night are falling. It's twilight time. You remember that song. Yeah. Um, the poem is called Twilight Time. And it, in the spirit of that song out of my childhood, imagines that my parents did like each other and did spend time together. Twilight time. It could only be a dream since the drapes are tied back. There is lilac sunset above rooftops 
and Sabbath candles flicker in their saucers just for play. How else could there be rhythm and blues on the Victrola at dusk? My mother softly sets the needle arm down and turns to smile at him through the static, spreading her feathered boa like angel's wings before gliding into my father's arms. <laughs> His easy chair has floated away, the sea of carpet has parted, and oak dark as the earth's heart holds them. I know it is only in dreams that their hands touch and twine, that shades of night would bring them together like this. All that is impossible is that it could have happened. They move to the smooth blend of the singer's voices. Love is in their eyes. Their separate days are given up to a mellow music, and now they're twirling together at last at twilight time. <coughs> you may applaud. I love it. It's oh, yeah. fine. <laughs> When, when I was 11, my father was in a terrible wreck, a terrible car wreck. Uh, he had a flat tire he pulled off to the side of the road, went behind the car to open the trunk and get out the spare tire, and another car jumped the curb and squashed him between the, the two cars, destroying his legs. He was in the hospital for nine months. And in those days, this would have been 1961, 1960, no, 1958, 1958, kids weren't allowed in the hospital. You know, you were, you had germs. So except for one astonishing moment when I was allowed to come in, because I was convinced he was in fact dead, and this whole story about a hospital was a lie. So they let me in, they let me see him, hung up in his bed in traction, and that was it. I didn't see him for nine months. Then he came home to where we lived on an island off the south shore of Long Island, a little island community called Long Beach. Um, I went to high school with Billy Crystal. We, we grew up in the same little island. Um, so my father was brought home and had to immediately be taken back to the hospital in this town to have his legs rebroken and reset. But we contrived a way to visit even though I wasn't allowed in the hospital. He was on the first floor. And this poem is about, it's called Visiting Hour, and it's about how I and a, a whole lot of other kids figured out how to see our parents when they were in the hospital. Visiting Hour. We came straight from school, crossing the island as winds rose and fell. From half a mile away, the white-capped bay water smelled of fuel oil, marsh grass, and autumn darkness. Gulls circled a trawler, nudging the dock. We gathered in an alley behind, behind the old hospital where our fathers recovered or declined or lingered behind the cold pains keeping them from us. We were too young and full of dangerous life to be allowed inside. Stroke, cancer of the lung, a broken hip, a severed arm, failing heart, we named our fathers by what held them there. Clot, stone, spine. Taking turns to stand on one another's shoulders, we tapped on windows as the sun set. Fathers smiled within the folds of their faces, waved, lay back among the pillows. They turned white before our eyes, became empty spaces in our lives, quiet behind glass in their gleaming ground room floors gleaming ground floor rooms. Mm -hmm. Damn, I hate when they do that. <laughs> <coughs> I had an older brother, Philip. He was eight years older than me. We were the two children. And we shared a room until he got married at the age of 21. So we were very different. And this is the shared room. My brother was a brill-creamed pompadour, and my brother was rock and roll first thing every morning. Then he was a four-door valiant, 
smoldering Kent, star sapphire ring on the pinky. He was small, savvy smiles and a wink, a deck of cards, shiny suit, shot cuffs, Windsor knots. My brother was miles ahead. He was goodbye, a man en route. <laughs> I was another story. I was crew cut and tucked shirt, double knotted shoes, please and thank you. I was too small to hit, too big for my britches. Cracker barrel cheese instead of Velveeta. Sorry, not clue. Cute, not suave, and too dumb to be believed. <laughs> My mother um, died a couple years ago, about a year and a half ago, at almost 97. Um, and for the last six or seven years of her life, Beverly and I brought her from New York out to Oregon um, as she declined into the deepest dementia. And near the end, she didn't have any idea who I was or who she was. Um, you all, I'm sure, know how this goes. And this poem is called Remember, and it's, it's about that period of time, very, very near the end. Remember, she says, for the rest of us are bound to forget. Her voice is a shadow of itself, calling us closer, the message all in her restless eyes, clouded by cataracts. We hold her hand. Remember, her silences say. She sees nothing beyond herself in this room filled with winter light, her son and his wife, their mingled breath, not long ago, she would have sung into the space between them, hummed when words failed her. No more. Remember is now the only word, word left to her, that and silence, which is a word in the place she is nearing, where winter light is the same thing as summer dark. I'd like to follow that with a poem called Lullaby, which is about the last time I saw her. Um, she had stopped eating, as Alzheimer's patients often do, and we knew that it was just a matter of days. Lullaby. The last time I saw my mother, she was turned toward the wall with her eyes closed. Light fell across her body and flickered as a spring wind passed through leaves outside her open window. Breath shallow, lips sealed. Still, she held on to life as I began singing to her, squeezing between bed and wall so she could feel the familiar words drift over her. Halfway through the final verse, her eyes opened suddenly and wide. They moved across my face, across the space between us, then vanished from sight as she returned to sleep. The song ended, and I knew it was time for silence. I'm going to either have to read faster or read fewer poems than I thought I was going to, or shut up in between them. Um, as some of you may know, 20 years ago, I contracted a virus that targeted my brain and left me totally disabled. This happened on an airplane flight across country. And it took me 15 years to get to walk without a cane. It took almost a year to learn to read again, to be able to write. And what you see before you is a work in progress. Um, I'm doing better because I know more about how to manage with my disability and my limitations. And every time I can come out to do something like this, I feel tremendously thankful um, and thankful to you for being here to witness it. The poem I... <laughs>
The poem I want to read next was written at, after three years of illness. And it's, it's called Saying What Needs to Be Said. And it focuses on the fact that my word finding powers were one of the first and deepest losses um, to this brain damage. Saying what needs to be said. Brain lesions have left my lexicon scrambled. Or maybe it's my brain that's scrambled and lexicon scattered to flecks of brain white. Words looming here and there like stars in a white sky of negative night. If the world's logic seems skewed, at least my brain has a pure logic now, a wild cross-wired beauty. So I say broadcast the cremation when I mean to say microwave the cream of wheat. <laughs> or I say my blood tests show amnesia, not the more common blood disorder, anemia. I walk into walls and say I walked into the roof. There are walls around abstract thoughts I crash into as well. The mere concept of health has become a well too deep to reach for words. I feel confusion like mine can make sense though. Take the confusion when I say Xerox the laundry and Xerox the lawn. Every machine is now a Xerox machine to me, which is just another way of saying what needs to be said anyway. Sick three years, I have learned to look at the bright side. You can see the darkest trouble is bright. For example, I don't say everything twice. I'd hate to be one who said everything twice. <laughs> it didn't seem funny at the time. <laughs> My book, In the Shadow of Memory, is, is a memoir of piecing myself back together. Um, and one of the things that astonished me in the reception that that book had was how many people have endured similar life-changing events. They may not have had brain damage. They may have had some other kind of sudden life-changing event. But Beverly and I got calls and letters from so many people who identified with the experience of being shattered and having to put yourself back together somehow. And that book tracks my assemblage of myself or reassemblage of myself. At the same time, my mother was declining from brain damage into, into dementia. That's just a promo, so you will want to buy the book when you're back there. Mm -hmm. One of the odd things about that book, too, for the reception, was that Barnes & Noble chose it for their Discover Great New Writers program. And at the time, I was 56, and it was my eighth book. <laughs> uh, but I was grateful, <laughs> very grateful. The next poem is called Channel, and it, it's a poem about coming to terms with illness. In time, the fork my life took as illness changed its course will wander to the main stream, and there below the long waterfalls and cataracts, I will begin my rush toward the place I was going from the start. I imagine looking back to see the silted mass where a huge bend holds sunlight in a net of evergreen, and the sky unable to bear its own violet brilliance a moment longer. Out of shadows where the channel crumbles comes the raucous sound a great blue heron makes when startled. Scent of peppermint rides breezes from the valley, and I catch hints of current beneath the surface just as darkness unfurls. And there, I imagine what was lost coming together with what was gained to pour itself at last into the sea. It was very tempting during the time I was writing the most poems about my illness to just disappear into my own symptoms and my own woe, you know? To just write about myself. 
And one of the things that I found to be enormously helpful was the reading that I was doing in biographies of artists whose lives had been changed by illness. Van Gogh, of course, comes to mind, and Ravel, and Mendelssohn, who died at 38, George Gershwin with his brain tumor. And I wrote a series of poems about other, about artists, Flannery O'Connor. And of course, they were all about me, too. They helped me understand what was happening to me. But they were essentially acts of getting outside myself, which is desperately important for the sick can become absolutely obsessed with themselves. I'd like to read you Starry Night, which might be about Van Gogh. <laughs> you all remember the images in that painting, Starry Night, and those images are in this poem, and it's spoken by Van Gogh. Tonight the moon throbs with light it seizes from stars as they rise, and the cypresses grow holy before my eyes. Wind fills the sky. I see clouds shudder, Houses and shops cower, but somehow high grass finds its own source of stillness. I think it is violet in nature. Never has there been such a night for seeing how the dark world thrives when day's brilliance dies and sight fully becomes a surprise. Who would want all these deep blues to soften as though toward dawn? No dawn will bring along a day as pure again. Who would want to be well enough to, to lose such hues? I know a man can be so far from madness the true world cannot find him. I know he will be saved only when the moon collects enough radiance to render heaven tangible as the breath of sunflowers. Look, there's a glow inside the emptiest spaces when we study their darknesses. There's also a hush no stroke of a painter's brush can muffle. Think of the instant swallows rising above a field you enter suddenly loop back in unison. A thick landscape of faith that is beyond words yet explains why I am standing here at all. <clears throat> a funny thing happened in all this writing about other artists and other figures whose lives changed were changed by illness. <coughs> oh, and maybe it also had to do with pain medication or herbs or whatever I was taking. But gradually, historical figures, <coughs> artists, began to visit me on the property we lived in, in Amity, in the 20 acres of woods. And so I began to write these visitation poems. They began with Rasputin, no. <laughs> the, you know, the, the mystical healer, perhaps, or crazy man who helped bring down the Tsar of Russia. And he wanted something from me, but I wasn't sure what. <coughs> and then the Tsar himself came as a, in a visit. And then Robert Frost came, and Gauguin came, and Bach. And T.S. Eliot, when our well went dry. Um, and so there's this whole series of poems that I wrote of, that were visitations. The one I want to read for you now is from Pee Wee Reese, the great Brooklyn Dodgers shortstop. Now, I told you I was born in Brooklyn in 1947. I was there when the Dodgers were there. I used to go to Ebbets Field. Um, when my brother was injured one summer at glass in his eye and was hospitalized, Pee Wee Reese came to the hospital to visit my brother. That's what the Dodger players did. They were in the community. Members of, so Pee Wee, I mean, he was practically family. <laughs> so it's not surprising that he would come to visit on the anniversary of his death. And all these visitations, I understood, were were meant to teach me something. I had a lesson to learn from each of these figures as they came. Um, Pee Wee Reese in Evening Shadow. I prayed for grounders when Pee Wee Reese fielded, hanging curves when he hit. 
At Ebbets Field in late August of my eighth year, I watched him drift under a wind-blown pop fly, moving from sunlight to shadow as he drew near home. Now, on the first anniversary of his death, the August night is wild with mosquitoes and bats, skunk in the compost. A pack of deer thrashes through tangled hazel and poison oak as they cross the hill below its crest in search of water. Nursing the day's final herbal concoction against joint pain and lost sleep, the same drink I have used all 12 years of my illness, I tilt my head back in its battered Dodger's cap to rest against the slats of an Adirondack chair as a screech owl's solo whistle pierces the endless crescendo of bullfrogs and bumblebees when Reese, at last, drifts back out of evening shadows. Wrinkled with age, stained by his long journey, he still moves with that old grace over the grass. I see anguish of long illness on his familiar face and something like relief, too, that rueful smile, the play finished, game over. I stand and his arm settles on my shoulder, a gesture he used to silence the harrowing of Jackie Robinson. He helps me find balance as the world spins, as it always does when I rise, and the whisper of wind is his voice saying, it will be all right. Pain is nothing. Stability is overrated. Drugs play havoc with your game. Lost sleep only means waking dreams. And illness is but a high pop fly that pulls us into shadow. He's gone as the wind he spoke with dies down. I find myself on the trail those deer walked, seeing where I am now, though already lost in a darkness that will soon reach home. Can you take six more poems? <laughs> I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it within the hour, and then we'll talk for a half hour. Um, the next poem I want to read is called The Role of a Lifetime. And it's about an actor who's about my age, around 60, who gets cast in the role of King Lear. And it scares the bejesus out of him. As some of you may know, if you're familiar with the play, one way of understanding Lear's behavior is that he is showing the signs of age-related dementia. So here's the role of a lifetime. He could not imagine himself as Lear. He could do age. He could rage on a heath, wounded pride, a man gone wild. He could be clear on those, stalking the stage, ranting beneath a moon tinged red. Let words rather than full-throated roars carry fury while the wind howled. He could do that. And the awful pull of the lost daughter, the old man more sinned against than sinning, the whole wheel of fire thing. But not play a wayward mind, be cut to the brains, strange to himself, his entire soul wrenched free, then remember his lines but act forgetting. Understand pure nonsense well enough to make no sense when saying it. Wits turned was one thing. Wits in absence performed with wit was something else. Playing Lear would force him to inhabit his fear, fathom the future he had almost reached already. Why, just last week, running here and there to find lost keys, a friend's name leached from memory, gone. No, nor could he bring himself to speak the plain and awful line that shows the man within the shattered king. I fear I am not in my perfect mind. I don't tend to write political poetry. 
But if there's one thing that might have brought me to do it, it's healthcare in America. Yeah. <laughs> it's another claim denied from the health insurance company when everything was done properly and everything was eligible for coverage. Not that it gets me angry or anything. <laughs> so this poem is called Terminal Condition. He feels his battle is not with cancer or chemo, but with health insurance claims. There seems no way to get a straight answer in time. It's like reading Henry James. <laughs> Sentences turning upon themselves, all delay and denial leading nowhere he has time to go. Another call, another hour on hold. This is health care in America, a system as sick as his own, devoured by growth gone wild, destroying what it is meant to sustain. Now a new voice is trying to explain the problem with treatment codes in his file as on the desk nearby, an old clock ticks. I was kind of surprised. I didn't know if that was a poem that would find an audience. You know, that was a, it's a sonnet. It, it, it's a, it rhymes. It's just, it's, you know, sonnets are supposed to be love poems. This is sort of the anti. <laughs> the first place I sent it, snatched it right up. I was really surprised. So it's going to appear in, of all places, the Hopkins Review, Johns Hopkins, so famous as a medical school. <laughs> you may or may not have noticed as I've been reading that my poems often rhyme that, for me, the old traditional sense of poetry and its music is at the heart of what I'm doing. And this next poem called Autumn Equinox is just that sort of thing. It relies almost more on its music than it does on its sense. It, as though I, f I feel that you'll get the poem just from listening to it, even if you didn't understand the words. Uh, I woke up in the autumn just after my 50th birthday and looked out the window and the line came to me, I feel my body letting go of light. And I reached into my bedside table and wrote that down real fast, you know, perfect iambic pentameter, check, you know, um, rich with, with meaning for me at the age of 50 at the autumn equinox. But the words sounded happy to me, sounded positive, even though I know that on first hearing, it sounds, uh-oh, I feel my body letting go of light. So I wanted to write the poem, a poem, that captured for me why that was a good thing. Autumn Equinox. I feel my body letting go of light, drawn to the wisdom of a harvest moon, I feel it welcome the lengthening night like a lover in early afternoon. My dreams are windfall in a field gone wild. I gather them through the lengthening night, and when they have all been carefully piled, my body begins letting go of light. Indian summer to leaf fall to first frost, the memories that were carefully piled become the dreams most likely to be lost. My dreams are windfall in a field gone wild, now that memory has abandoned them, now that Indian summer, leaf fall, first frost, have become the same amazing autumn skein of those dreams most likely to be lost. I feel my body letting go of light. I feel it welcome the lengthening night, the windfall of dreams that have long been lost to all Indian summer, leaf fall, and first frost. Among her many, many talents, 
Beverly is a brilliant impressionist landscape oil painter. She makes baskets. She weaves. Um, she's studying to be a master gardener and has a magic touch with plants. She's also a licensed clinical social worker and for a time worked in hospice out in Yamhill County where we lived. And during the time she was doing that work, we would talk a lot about the idea of a good death, an idea that really filled our house. And the poem I'm going to read to you next, The End of Dreams, is my best guess at what a good death might be like. The End of Dreams. He wakens knowing this to be the day his hopeless singing voice will at last sound exactly like the young Robert Goulet. <laughs> it is the day for him to touch the ground as only noble Fred Astaire has done before and only once and with someone perfect in his arms. He will be able to accompany himself on the grand piano by sight, bass hand and treble hand like swallows in flight, each magic hand nimble and light as the air that trembles with the music he will make at the end of all his dreams. It feels simple and right to draw in all the air he can, to grow sail, still, then soar. Now they all stand around his bed in tears, and he sees the pure light that means the time has come for him to sound the first note, take the first step, and let go. And now, to end where I began with a love poem, I want to read Transformations, which is over almost before it begins, so you really got to pay attention. Um, you know that science has taught us that our cells regenerate, replenish themselves, replace themselves over time. Transformations for Beverly. The molecules in my brain are no longer the same as the ones that first knew your smile. But the memory of that moment remains. My new skin remembers your first touch. My reborn heart, the first steady beats of yours against my chest. The small oval window in the wall of my ear where nothing is the way it was then still holds the sound of your first sleeping breath. Thank you. So now we're at the question and answer period. And you're not allowed to leave because the books are for sale back there. And I can't be here and there at the same time to sign your book. Does anybody have any questions? or? Comments or? I have a, kind of a couple of questions. One of them is I've always imagined you in, it's Amity, right? I always knew you were there, and I kind of imagined this wonderful pastoral setting. I was so proud of you that you were avoiding the whole urban life, that you were making your way out there. Um, so I, well, there is, I am kind of curious that it sounds like 20 years out there. So it seems like a big decision to come into Portland. Yeah. So I'm curious about that. Also, I'm curious about another thing. I, I'm guessing you chose not to teach. Um, and maybe part of that was illness, but I'm curious about the other is We've got a lot of people getting MFAs these days who are teachers. And I have always thought there was a danger of that. Mm -hmm. so. Well, about the move, Beverly's parents live in Lake Oswego, and they're 90 and 85, and it was time for us to take care of them. And that's what brought us into Portland. We were seven minutes from their house. I cooked dinner for them every Sunday night. You know, Beverly took him to the doctor today um, when he had his open heart surgery. I taught myself how to play checkers so that I could, you know, and we just, we needed to be with him. It was time. Um, and also, at, as I neared 60 and being disabled, it's a lot of work 
to take care of a really kind of primitive woodsy right. setting. You know, you look away and the woods come in around your house. <laughs> and you know, blackberry bushes and the poison oak. It was a lot of work and Beverly was doing most of it. Um, plus the place was teeny. And we just, just felt like we had done what we needed to do out there. I, I would say that we hardly miss it at this point. It was, we were ready to, to be in town and to do this next thing that we had to do. And no, I, I, I chose not to teach. I started down the teaching path. Uh, I went to grad school in you know, 1969, 1970, thinking I'd get a PhD and be a writing teacher and all that, and decided it wasn't the life I wanted. And I wanted to write, but I wanted to live in the world. And I spent 17 years writing in the field of politics and public policy while writing at night and on weekends, thinking, you know, if I just had more time, I would write more. Then I got sick and had all the time in the world and actually less time to write because of the nature of my illness. Um, so be careful what you wish for. Yeah. One thing. Um, I do occasionally do a workshop now. Um, and I, I like... I like that, but I agree with you about it's really kind of dangerous and loopy that the MFA society kind of self-perpetuates a, a way of writing and a, a smallness of vision. That's dangerous, but it's not always the case. My daughter, who is a wonderful writer, teaches at the University of Memphis, um, is on the nonfiction writing faculty there, and she's doing great things with, with the students. So. Yes, Tom. Do you have a preferred form of writing because you're writing novel and poetry and memoir? Or are you writing all three simultaneously? Or I would say a couple things. I'd say a couple things. First is I'm a poet first and always. It was what I did first as a writer and I think forms the basis of my writing. You'll notice, well, you know, the compression, the, the, the tightness, that is part of what poetry is, I think informs my prose. So, you know, my longest novel is like 199 pages and I, I, I write, my prose is very oriented around the sensibility of a poet. Um, but there are things that I found that I needed to say that needed a larger canvas than a, what a poem offers me. And I needed to move out into other directions. I think I'm through with fiction. Um, the first two novels that I wrote, I wrote before I got sick, although they didn't come out till after I got sick. And the third was three quarters done, or two thirds done when I got sick. So really in the 20 years, the only novel I wrote was the newest one, Patient 002, which took 13 years to write. Um, I have great fun writing fiction, but I think I'm through with it. I think for me, given the limited time that I have in which to work and the limited energy, it makes more sense to concentrate and poetry is at the heart of it and the other thing I'm concentrating on is, is nonfiction, mostly memoir. Although the book I'm writing, I'm just beginning now, is the first nonfiction book that I don't think is going to be a memoir. So I think I'm done with fiction. So you better buy novels because there could be collector's <laughs> items. <'cause laughs> well, yes. The uh, the uh, love poems and the uh, family poems that you read are they both from the end of dreams or are they is that, is that a mixture? They're in all the books. Um, from the Fiddler's Trance, the Evening Light, Approximately Paradise, and the End of Dreams. Those are all books I wrote after getting sick. And they all have the mix of poems of place, love poems, visitations, and sick artists and composers. And um, My first book, Music Appreciation, which was almost completed when I, first got, when I got sick, has a lot of poems about my childhood and, a, and about the very beginning of getting sick. Um, but most of the poems were written before I got sick. 
and it feels to me like a very different book. The only poem from that book I read tonight was Twilight Time, which is one of my earliest poems. <laughs>